Uh, I would like to thank the organizers in, in putting uh, those interesting sort of, say, couples together. <laughs> And uh, um, I think I'm, I'm on, the, on the bad side because, I mean, I have to work with humans and I cannot go into the details, you know, of, uh, you know, what we may want to know about language. So I think the only point I can make at the moment is the following. Um, I assume that language, uh, um, the language faculty is based on a genetically predetermined structural neural network, and I will be talking about that a bit, of which then dynamical neurophysiological process and principles apply. Um, and uh, I think uh, we should also consider that uh, we have uh, a fixed uh, biological program um, for the development of this. So, I mean, it cannot go faster, it cannot go slower, and we have also shown this. So the second thing I would like to make is uh, that the language capacity is rooted in a specific computation called merge that binds words together to form phrases and sentences. So very simple. If you do that more often, you get more complex structures. So now, with respect to the language network, um, we know quite a bit. We know already that there are uh, <laughs> fiber tracks that connect Broca's area and Wernicke's area. And uh, we also have some idea about what these fiber tracts are doing. So um, the dorsal fiber tract, color coded here in purple, that goes from BA44 um, to the uh, posterior temporal cortex is supposed, and I will show that, to uh, support syntactic processes. Uh, for the ventral parts, I will focus here on the fiber tract that goes from BA45 to the temporal cortex, which is supposed to support semantic processes. So this is a very simple, oversimplified model, I have to say. <coughs> However, now, um, with respect to the next issue, um, with respect to merge, can we localize merge in the brain? Yes, we can. So what we have done in an experiment and a follow-up of several experiments, we have shown that you can localize uh, merge in BA44 in a very confined area that is uh, the most uh, anterior ventral part that is color-coded in red here. And when you look into the individual subjects, you see that they all you know, cluster in that area. So there is very little variance between the subjects, which already might indicate a certain universality of this computation. But I think we certainly have to show that this is the case in further studies. Thus now we have, I mean, two major things that we need, at least for a processing syntax, which is the core of language. That is merge in 44 and this wonderful fiber track going from 44 to the posterior temporal cortex. But can we show that this uh, fiber track is really involved in syntactic processes? Um, yes, we can. Um, we have done so in looking at those fiber tracts uh, uh, in the development, in the developing brain from age three on up to adults. And you can see that the ventral fiber tract, the green one, is pretty stable with respect to its, its strength, uh, strengths. But that uh, the dorsal fiber tract um, really, you know, grows particular only, you know, after puberty. So this is very interesting, but what we want to show is that uh, the strength of the fiber track correlates with the ability to process syntactically complex sentences. And we have done so uh, in also having those uh, children and older uh, su uh, subjects then uh, in the scanner, and we were looking at both things, the function um, uh, of the activation, you know, in the particular areas, we looked at the um, behavior that the subjects were doing, and we looked at uh, the myelin strengths uh, in those different fiber tracts, the dorsal one and the ventral one. And what we found is the following. We found that there is a strong correlation between uh, the performance on processing syntactically <coughs> complex sentences, you can see this uh, in, the, in the upper right of, of uh, the slide, and there you find the correlation both for um, accuracy and speed of processing. 
So this uh, looks quite nice, and uh, we have at least one indication that this fiber track is uh, uh, responsible for syntactic processing. There are other data from patients, for example, from Stephen Wilson, showing uh, that uh, when this fiber track uh, is not uh, integer, any, integer anymore, that you also have a going down in the processing of syntax. Now, what we also want to show is uh, that this fiber track that we see here um, across the different ages is a universal one. Uh, and we try to test this uh, in brains uh, from people with different languages and uh, the languages that we were testing here were three languages. That was uh, English, uh, German, and uh, Chinese. So what you can see here is uh, basically the um, color coded, the difference between the strengths and the different fiber tracks in the brains from people, you know, either lifelong use of German, English, uh, or Chinese. And this is quite interesting because uh, it appears that uh, there is this basic fiber uh, tracks are there, but they are modulated as the function of the input. And uh, we can also explain uh, the differences uh, very simply, maybe with respect to German, which is a highly morphosyntactic language. You see um, the dorsal fiber track um, that is very strong. And uh, for English, where you can heavily rely, you know, at least when processing simple sentences um, on uh, semantics because you have a fixed word order, there the ventral fiber track, the green one, is stronger. Now for Chinese, you find, you know, the strongest differences in the um, parietal cortex. So why should that be so? For the other two languages, we had a clear hypothesis. For this language, the interpretation is pretty post hoc, I have to admit. Um, but uh, you know that uh, Chinese has a lot of homophones and uh, you need contextual information and thus verbal working memory um, to <coughs> identify the particular uh, information of a homophone. And uh, this area in the parietal cortex is known to support verbal working memory. Maybe most intriguingly, we also found uh, at least this very strong fiber track from BA44 to the posterior uh, temporal cortex in deaf signers. In deaf signers who had learned sign language from very early on. So there was language input, but no auditory input. I think this is also a strong argument for um, saying that uh, there may be a universality in this uh, neural language network. <coughs> Okay, but now that's not the whole story. I mean, we want to turn to the dynamics uh, in the language network, and uh, there we have a problem. You know, what we want to do is we want to look at the different levels, if possible, molecular level, a level of neural ensembles, and the macro uh, functional level. And the data that we have, you know, are very sparse, but we do have data from the different levels. <laughs> so let me first talk about uh, um, the molecular level. So we had the idea that those areas that are part of the language network, and these are color coded in red here, um, are um, more similar in their neurotransmitter structure than other areas. And uh, what you can see in the diagram is that those red areas cluster together um, with respect to their similarity in the neurotransmitters much more than the other areas in other cortical regions, for example, visual <laughs> cortex and other areas. So what does that mean? Well, the neurotransmitter structure you know, is relevant um, at the synaptic level. I mean, we have heard that. But uh, that's, you know, as far as we can go in the moment. And I have to say, I mean, these are, you know, ex vivo data. I mean, these are cadaver brains, right? And what you would like to know is, you know, what is happening, you know, in the, in the living brain. But there we don't have the possibility to really go that much into detail and we have to rely um, on other data. 
So let me also uh, give you uh, even um, a stronger indication. Those regions that I have color coded here with larger red areas are those regions that are involved in syntactic processing. And it's interesting to see that the similarity between those areas within the language network is even stronger than with a larger network. Okay, so much for this now. The only possibility that we can do now is to look at functional uh, communication at uh, a more sort of uh, upper level. And that's then the level of uh, uh, functional activation and functional connectivity as uh, we have uh, you know, seen it over the past years coming up from a number of different uh, laboratories. Again, you see um, those different areas that I have been alluding to um, before um, are um, activated together most of the time when it comes down to process complex sentences. And the DCIM-M analysis also shows you um, the interaction between those areas during uh, processing uh, syntactically complex versus simple sentences. But if we want to um, talk about the dynamics in the system, we certainly you know, also want to look at other data in case they are available. And uh, these data are now sort of coming up from different labs. So with respect to the neural synchronization within the syntactic language network, what one can show is that uh, the areas uh, that are color coded here are areas um, that uh, show a difference um, when comparing the processing of uh, uh, highly embedded sentences with less embedded sentences. Um, interestingly, um, in a um, sort of analysis where we use uh, time frequency spectra, we can see that uh, the theta synchronization you know, is very strong and significant between those areas that we have seen sort of being relevant for the processing of uh, syntactically complex sentences. This is not the only work here. I think there's this wonderful work by Ding uh, coming from David Peppel's lab. And this work nicely also demonstrates that processing phrases and sentences compared to syllable sequences is uh, reflected in different frequency bands. Phrasing, again, is reflected in the coherent activation of inferior frontal and temporal cortices. Um, now, let me briefly summarize, I mean, what we have so far. We have uh, uh, theoretically assumed basic syntactic computation merge that is uh, localized in the ventral portion of BA44. Um, uh, BA44 is structurally connected um, to the posterior temporal cortex uh, via the dorsal pathway, which, as we have shown, is relevant for syntactic processing. Um, the entire language network, but in particular those areas that are involved in syntactic processing, have a um, high structural similarity at the molecular level. Um, the functional connectivity also shows us that these areas are working together um, and uh, the recent uh, electrophysiological data show that too. So in the end, what we could do is at least at that point uh, describe uh, the, the cortical circuit of language processing and have some information about which area talks to one, to, to which other area in during what time constraints. So all these data somehow propose that uh, the dorsal language system, if we want to call this a system, BA44 together with um, the fiber track to the uh, temporal cortex, um, is relevant for language, and uh, in particular for syntax. And uh, I think given this, um, this would may also call um, attention uh, with respect to two things, ontogeny on the one hand and phylogeny on the other hand. So when comparing with respect to the data that we have, what we find is that doing ontogeny, this dorsal fiber track, the purple one, that goes into or targets BA44 is not present in human newborns. 
It's only present in human adults, and we have seen that it grows over development. Also, when comparing um, macaques to human adults, um, we see that uh, the dorsal fiber tract is the one that really, you know, is not uh, uh, present uh, or only weakly present in macaques, and it's very strong in the human adults. So here I would claim that the dorsal fiber tract is crucial for syntax, which is not there in the prelinguistic infant and not in the macaque, but only in the human adult. So, but, I mean, there are still a lot of open questions, as you all know. And in particular, um, I think an intriguing question that we have sort of, you know, been discussing already or seen being discussed in the former talks is uh, how is the content of information that is, you know, transferred from one brain area to the other within that network, how is that coded? Or in other terms, how is the information encoded in the sending region and decoded in the receiving region? And uh, I have not a full blow idea on this, but uh, I think it's intriguing, you know, to see that when you do brain stimulation in Broca's area or in the posterior temporal cortex, that you get uh, cortical, cortical evoked potentials both ways round. So um, I asked myself whether this could be the basis uh, for uh, thinking about um, uh, mirror neural ensembles which uh, could work the following way. You have a, a particular concept, and you uh, encode this particular concept in a neural ensemble of different neurons reflecting different features, either semantic or syntactic features. Now, the neural ensembles then um, are active, you know, in either Broca's area or then, you know, another area where information has to be sent to, and there are sort of respective neurons. And in order to have successful processing from one area to the next, you need you know, a particular larger overlap of those different neurons. Does not be, have to be 100%, but su substantial overlap in order to really make communication going. I mean, this is a, a poor hypothesis, uh, but you know, it uh, leads to a prediction that uh, you should find a high pattern similarity in those regions that are communicating with each other. So the activation of mirror neural ensembles in the sending and receiving region may guarantee, and this is a may, uh, the successful information transfer. Um, some of this is written down in a book that will be coming out this fall. And with that, I would like to thank those that have been working with me over the past years. And I would like to thank you for your attention.